Welcome everybody, my name is Nina Kinsler, I'm one of the two directors of the Bolini Center, and I welcome you uh, very much to today's second Bolini Center seminar, which is today hosted by RA2. We have a guest here, it is Professor Merete Bilde from the Department of Chemistry from our University in Denmark. And uh, this new seminar series is both for us, so that we know within the Bolin Center what is going on in the individual research areas. It is also for us to meet regularly, once a month, and it's also for us to uh, collaborate and exchange with people outside the Bolin Center. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Matt, who will be introducing it in a little bit more detail. And uh, I wish you uh, a good time with the talk. Thank you. Thanks, Nina. Yes, so it's, uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, on behalf of Research Area 2, introduce Professor Moretta Bild, as Nina has just alluded to. Um, of course, the Research Area 2, we, we're interested in aerosols, clouds, turbulence, and climate. And as you can see from the title of Moretta's talk, it, uh, well, it certainly has two of those uh, words in, in, the, uh, in the title, and of course involves others as well. Um, Moretta is, uh, has, a, has a long career, I suppose, since, since you finished your PhD, um, in looking at sea spray aerosol and uh, its interactions with clouds. Um, as far as I understand it, if I get this right now, Moretti, you're actually a physical chemist as your background. Yeah. So you did your PhD um, in Denmark um, with uh, Ole John Nielsen, I think it was, um, on uh, the atmospheric chemistry of uh, halogenated methanes. Met methanes, yes. Um, and then you did two postdocs over in the U.S. I think you continued in the same in the same field. You were at Carnegie Mellon, um, and also in Pittsburgh. And then, following this, you came back to to Denmark to do uh, to start a research group in Copenhagen. And I think that's where you really started doing some of this work on sea spray aerosols and clouds. And you've now continued that in in Aarhus, where you're really expanding your your group and looking at some of the processing of these aerosols and things. I hope I have covered uh, a lot of what, uh, what Moretta does. I know one, one important thing we should say is that last, just last year Moretta was awarded, uh, or in 2015, uh, by NOSA, the uh, Aerosol Aerosologist Award, which is a, quite a, a big award here in, in Scandinavia in terms of aerosols. So with that, I will, I will welcome Moretta to, to give her talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt, for the kind introduction, and thanks for the invitation to speak here. I'm very honored. Um, as Matt said, I will talk about sea spray aerosol and cloud formation. And um, I'll just tell you a little bit first about Aarhus University. So Aarhus University is situated here in Denmark. It's a relatively new university established in 1928. But it has four faculties, arts, business, social sciences and Health and where I am, science and technology. There are 27 departments, and then some years ago, the former uh, several national labs were merged with universities in Denmark. So, for example, the former um, uh, environmental agency was merged with Aarhus University. You might know some of the people there who work in uh, Roskilde. And there are several other places around Denmark that are part of Aarhus University. Uh, yeah, some different numbers. There are 12,000 staff members and 40,000 students. And a strong infrastructure in many ways. One of the things I will tell you about is a research vessel that can be used for studies on the sea. Some of you may also know the William Research Station, a new station opened up here at, at the top of uh, Greenland. And I come from the Department of Chemistry. There are 28 faculty members and an equal amount of technical persons, 400 students in chemistry, 120 PhD students. And uh, the department is quite proud to be ranked pretty high in Europe, the world, and also on a Norforsk list as the highest ranked, this is in the Nordic uh, comparing, highest ranked department across disciplines when it com came to publications and citations and things like this. So. That was the introduction about where I come from. I will talk about the atmosphere, about sea spray aerosol, and then some properties of these sea spray aerosol. What are they and why are we interested in them? I'll show you some results from my own group, 
some of it in collaboration with people here from Stockholm. And then I will also share some thoughts with you about what we plan to do in the future. Hopefully, maybe during the afternoon, we can have some uh, discussion also. So the atmosphere, it's what, if we go outside and look up, we have the atmosphere. And what is plotted here is the temperature and then the height above the surface of the Earth. And the atmosphere is characterized by a special temperature profile. As we go up, temperature decreases, and then we reach the tropopause. So this part, the lower part of the atmosphere, is called the troposphere. Tropos is Greek. It means turn around. So the air in the troposphere is mixed, whereas the air in the stratosphere is more is layered. And we see an increase in the temperature because of chemistry, because of the ozone layer up here. And much of what I will talk about takes place here, down here in the troposphere. If you go out and look up, it may seem that the atmosphere is infinite. It goes on and on and on. We know that's not true. But just to put this in perspective, we are now here. And if you go to the globe, you have already passed through what corresponds to the distance to the tropopause, that is where 75% of the mass of the atmosphere is present. And if you travel to Arlanda, it corresponds to going through 99% of the mass of the atmosphere. So, this is a famous NASA photo of the Earth seen from space. But it kind of puts in perspective that the atmosphere is really just a thin shell around us, protecting us from a lot of things, keeping us warm, allowing us to live, to have oxygen. And so there's a lot of interest, of course, is what goes on in this atmosphere. And I'll just focus on some part of it. When we study the atmosphere, there are some physical parameters that are important. Its pressure varies, temperature varies. There's radiation of different kinds. There's a large spread of relative humidities from very, very dry to more than 100% relative humidity. And for chemists, it's very interesting that we have stable molecules, but we also have radicals, molecules that have a free electron that are extremely reactive. We have organic and inorganic molecules. We have several phases. The atmosphere is not just a gas phase. We have a solid phase, we have a liquid phase, we have a gas phase. We have multi-phase systems. And we have seemingly also life in the atmosphere. There's a field called aeromicrobiology, and a lot is happening right now studying the role of microbes in the atmosphere. So chemists also think a lot about times for different reactions. How long time do things uh, take? And if I emit something here, like uh, whatever compound it could be, this is based in the US, but we might as, as well emit it from here. It's useful to know a little bit about how long time does it take, whatever I emit here, these molecules, to distribute themselves around the globe. So it takes weeks to distribute themselves in this way, it takes about a year to cross equator. But within one to two years, a molecule will be equally distributed um, in these directions. We can also think about how long time does it take to reach the tropopause to mix vertically, and it takes about a month for a molecule to mix within the troposphere. And then there's a big jump. It takes years to cross uh, into the stratosphere. So if we want to kind of keep a budget of what happens in this part of the atmosphere where we are walking around the troposphere, we can think, OK, how do things enter the troposphere? They enter by natural emissions or human activities, anthropogenic emissions, or chemical reactions. And they can leave again by deposition. They can hit a surface and stick there, carried out by rain. 
They can disappear by chemical reactions or they can be transported to the troops. And so if you account for these uh, mechanisms, you can, and then you say that mass has to be conserved, we can calculate what we call lifetimes. So the time it takes for something to reach 1 over e of its initial value. And so this plot shows a spatial scale and a temporal scale. And so it demonstrates that in the atmosphere we have things that live in the atmosphere, so to speak, only on very short time scales, seconds. These are radicals, extremely short-lived reactive species. This one, O8, reacts with everything that has a CH bond in the atmosphere. And it only moves around on a scale of meters. Then we have some really long-lived species. And you've probably heard about the CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons. They stay in the atmosphere for maybe hundreds of years. And they move around yeah, this completely tens of thousands of kilometers. And then in the middle here we have moderately long species, and here we find aerosols. Small airborne nano and microparticles surrounded by air, which I will focus on in the rest of this talk. But so keep in mind that they live in, in the atmosphere for time scale of days, weeks, maybe months. And then they are removed. So it means that things in the climate system are connected. There are interactions between what is emitted over the oceans, for example, and what is emitted over land. There's interactions between what's emitted from the ocean surface and what goes on in terms of cloud formation, for example. And I think you are so few, so if you have questions on the way, you can just ask them. <laughs> So what I will focus on, and what is the focus on this talk, is what comes out of the, what comes out of the uh, oceans. So about 70% of the globe is covered by ocean. And sea spray aerosol are small particles emitted when we have wind-generated wave breaking. So it's driven by wind breaking waves. And what happens when a wave breaks is that we have entrainment of air into the water. So we have air bubbles underneath the water surface. These air bubbles rise. And as they reach the surface, so here's a drawing. You have an air bubble in the water. It rises. And as it reaches the surface, it breaks. And we have emission of small droplets and particles. And there are two types. We have the initial kind of breaking here. We have what's called film droplets. And then from the middle here, we have emission, ejection of what's called jet droplets. This is not just a tiny amount of material coming out in the, at the atmosphere. It's huge amounts of material. And the oceans via sea spray aerosol is next to dust, the largest source by mass of aerosol particles to the atmosphere. There's some uncertainty to exactly how much sea salt is coming out. So you can see the best estimates vary between 118 and around 4 times 10 to the 12 kilos per year. But it's anyway a lot of material coming out every second. And these sea spray aerosols, they have an effect on climate. And the particles can affect climate, we say, directly. They can affect climate directly by interacting with solar radiation, scattering light, or absorbing light. So that's the direct effect of these particles. They can also have an indirect effect on climate, and that's via their ability to act as seeds for cloud formation. So we wouldn't have clouds without the presence of particles. The water molecules need something to condense on. So this doesn't happen in the atmosphere. We need particle surfaces to be involved. And this indirect effect is illustrated here. Perhaps some of you have seen it before. But <coughs> this 
illustrates how particles affect the radiative properties of clouds. So in this case to the right, we have few particles that can form cloud droplets. Few cloud condensation nuclei, they are called. And so the water molecules distribute themselves between few droplets. They become large, and so there are few surfaces that can scatter light, and the cloud appears gray. If we introduce particles that are good seeds for cloud formation, the water molecules divide themselves between all these surfaces, and we get small droplets and surfaces that more surfaces that can scatter light, and the cloud appears white. So in this way, particles can affect radiative properties of clouds and also cloud lifetime. So this cloud has a longer lifetime than this one over here. And how can that be described? I will not go into a lot of theory, but to describe, and in the following we will just distinguish between two types of clouds, warm clouds and cold clouds. In the warm clouds I will refer to are liquid water droplets. And to form a cloud droplet, In this graph, it's illustrated, we imagine that you have a particle, and in this case, it's a particle consisting of a salt, ammonium sulfate. And it's initially 100 nanometers in diameter. And you can ask, what does it take to make a cloud droplet out of this particle? And it takes a supersaturation of water. So this is the, you can say it's the relative humidity, this corresponds to 100% relative humidity. So to form a cloud droplet, you need a certain supersaturation of water, a little bit more than 100% relative humidity. And what this Köhler theory predicts is what is this, we call it critical supersaturation, the saturation ratio of water needed to form a cloud droplet. And that's a key parameter in models, and that's something that we are looking to find experimentally and to see what is this, what is needed for a sea spray aerosol to form cloud droplets. There is a parameter, it's called kappa, that has gained a lot of popularity within this field. The last, since, when was it introduced? 2007, I think. And I will also use it, so I will not go through all the equations, but if you have not heard about kappa before, think of it as a measure of hygroscopicity. How easy is it for a particle to take up water? And if something is completely insoluble in water, kappa is zero. For a salt like sodium chloride, kappa is of the order of 1.3. And ammonium sulfate, 0.6. Atmospheric aerosols often over land down here. So the higher kappa value, the better the particle is at taking up water. Um, and if you have determined kappa, the idea of this kappa is, one of the ideas also, that if you have determined kappa for a sodium chloride and you have determined kappa for an organic molecule, and you have a particle that consists of organic and salt, you can find the kappa value of this mixed particle from a simple addition rule, where you just take the fraction of organic and the fraction of salt and multiplied by the individual kappa value. And we will, I will come back to, to this, whether or not this rule holds for sea spray aerosol. Okay. So, any questions to this? Okay. So, you can think of kappa as a measure of the ability to form a cloud droplet. When it comes to ice clouds in the atmosphere. The picture is more complicated, and I will just mention it briefly here and not go into detail with it, but there are several kind of mechanisms for forming some of these beautiful ice crystals that you can form in the atmosphere. The thing is that this is a plot, came out a few years ago, trying to summarize understanding of the ability of different types of particles to form ice crystals. So what you see here is the temperature at which they can form ice crystals. And I think just looking at a plot 
and seeing something like this shows that there's a lack of understanding. But one thing you can notice is that these green ones are biologically related. So in general, biological species, biological aerosol can form ice clouds at very high temperatures, whereas uh, the, all the red ones are different types of dust, and the blue ones are organics. So it's known that biological material is much more efficient in, in forming ice crystals than many other species. But there's a lot of uh, things to do here to understand this better. And it's quite relevant for uh, because there are biological components in the ocean and they are emitted to the atmosphere. So it's a an area of a lot of current interest. But now if we take a step back and look at the properties of particles coming out of the ocean, what are the important properties to try to understand how good are they at forming cloud droplets and what are their climate impacts? Then the size of the particles, the sea spray aerosol, is one important parameter. And the size spans an enormous range from a few nanometers and up to several micrometers. So you can also imagine this also affects their interaction with light and their optical properties, for example. And these are just a nice review by, I think all my re references have disappeared from the the menu bar. Yeah, OK. In many of the figures, there are references down here. <laughs> So this is from a review paper by De Leuvedal, uh, where, uh, yeah, it's down here, 2011, where they try to summarize what is known about the size distribution of sea spray aerosol. Another important um, parameter is morphology. And I think there's still a lot to be done here. I think, I know you're doing some interesting things uh, here in Stockholm. We did some... Uh, um, imaging using uh, electron microscopy on sea spray aerosols that we had generated in the lab a few years ago. And for those particles sized around 60 to 100 nanometer, and this is just artificial sea salt, we saw that they looked like kind of cubes with, with rounded edges. But this is just pure sea salt. Um, and I think there's studies going on around what does organics do to this and, and what is this uh, at different sizes, for example. But shape morphology is an important parameter. And then another parameter that's, that there's a lot of interest in is what is the chemical composition of these particles coming out of the ocean? And we know the, well, the ocean contains salts. So there are different inorganic ions. And it's also known that there is biological material in the water and at the surface of the water, there's something called the sea surface microlayer, a layer of soap-like molecules uh, containing different kinds of organics. And this was a nice paper from 2015 where they um, put this in, summarized it in this figure, so you can imagine that you have air bubbles in the water rising. They could pick up organic molecules on their way to the surface. They could also pick something up maybe when they are lying here. And when they burst, you can have emission of salts as well as organic material to the atmosphere. Now, the interesting thing is that what is coming out into the atmosphere does not always have the same composition as the water that it comes from. And that has been shown in some field studies. This is from, from Maze Head. And it, this is the particle size. And this is mass fraction of different species. And so what you can see is that the smaller the particles are, the more organic, mater organic material they have. Whereas the big particles are almost only salt. So this is referred to as enrichment, that these small particles are enriched in organic material. Even if they come from the same water, they don't have the chemical, same chemical composition, depending on their size. This study shows the same. This is a study from the group here in Stockholm showing that there can actually also be enrichment of inorganic ions compared to the seawater. 
So this is intriguing to think about why is, why is this happening? And what is the impact of it when it comes to climate? And the last thing is the phase. What is the phase of these particles? That's something that is quite interesting in general to ask the question, what is the phase of organic aerosols? There are also organic aerosols in here. And it is, if you look through the literature, it's an open question still. What is the phase of these? Is it lit glass balls that you are inhaling right now? Or is it um, more like liquids? Or is it amorphous solid states? That's uh, kind of a hot uh, area right now. And when it comes to sea spray aerosol, there are also studies showing, this is also from here, studies suggesting that there are, or showing that coming from the ocean is kind of gel-like structures. And so these could have very different impacts or effects on clouds and ability to form clouds. So this was um, some general introduction. And now I will kind of switch a little bit and tell about how we in, uh, in Aarhus are trying to study some of these things. Uh, and we have done different types of laboratory uh, experiments. And of course, we cannot mimic uh, the ocean in a little uh, container in the lab. But we hope and we think that we can understand some of the processes that goes on by doing some focused lab studies. And one thing we have is what we call a sea spray tank. There's also one here that you can go and take a look at. This one is smaller. This one was designed a few years ago in Copenhagen. So it's a stainless steel container. And we can have in this one 10 liters of water. And we can entrain air into the water either by a plunging jet, so that's why we have a pump here, can circulate air, uh, uh, sorry, water. And when the, this jet of water hits the water surface, we entrain air and we see air bubbles rise. Or we can simply bubble air through a frit at the bottom of the tank. And um, then we measure the particles that are formed, because we do see that then particles are formed in the headspace of the tank. And there are instruments that can measure the size of particles. I won't go into the details, but if some of you are familiar with the uh, mass spectrometers, this one works. It bends the particles not according to their mass, but according to their electrical mobility. So the particles come in, they have all different sizes. In this column, it's an electric field, and depending on the ratio of the particle size to charge, they are bent in this electric field, and we can decide what's, what size come out at the bottom. And then the particles are so small, if they are 80 nanometers in diameter, we cannot see them optically directly, but what we can do is we can condense a liquid on them, and then they can be counted optically one by one. So there's instruments, standard instruments, for measuring particle size and for counting them also. And then one of our goals was to study how good are these particles at forming clouds. And we have two types of instruments for studying that. We have one that's built at the University of Wyoming, and we have one that's a commercial uh, instrument from, um, from Boulder. Uh, in both instruments, what's done is that we simulate the conditions where clouds are formed, so we have a little bit more than 100% relative humidity. And we expose the particles to a little bit more than 100% humidity, and we can detect if they grow to the size of a cloud droplet or not. And the data looked like this. So we take one particle diameter at a time, and we look, does it form a cloud droplet or not? So this is called the activated fraction, the fraction of the particles that form a cloud droplet. And at some point we see this is the activation. And so we know if we have a supersaturation of 1.5%, only particles that are this size or larger can form cloud droplets. 
So last year, we, during April and May, two or three times uh, a week, we went down to the Bay of Aarhus and collected seawater and took it back to the lab directly, and we put it in the tank and measured different properties of this um, sea spray. And what did we see? First, we measured the size of the particle form. Um, we measured during April of May because we, um, we also did measurements of chlorophyll, for example, and we were hoping to see some variation in uh, biological activity and perhaps some variation in the properties of the particles. What we did see was that the size distribution we measured, so we put the seawater in the tank, we turned on the plunging jet and generated particles, and this was the size distribution of particles we, we saw, and it was pretty much the same during both months. Um, we saw a little shoulder here, and then we saw a mini maximum here around 100 nanometers. No, around 80 nanometers. And then we measured the ability of the particles to form cloud droplets. And this is what we saw. Some of you are used to look at plots like this. So this is the particle diameter. This is the supersaturation needed for a certain particle to form a cloud droplet. And these are lines of this constant kappa value. And you don't need to think so much about this. The thing was that during the whole campaign, the particles behaved more or less just like sea salt. Um, the black dots are artificial sea salt. And you see there's basically no variation. A little bit of variation, but it, in general, the particles were always like sea salt. What we also did was that we, um, you can collect what's called the sea surface microlayer. So you dip a glass plate into the water, you take it out, and you scrape off whatever kind of this microlayer sample that's there. Yes? No, this is uh, 30, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. Yeah, OK, sorry, the axis look. This is 100 nanometers. So the smallest one are 30. Yeah, yeah. So this was just bulk seawater that we had collected. What we also did is that we spiked this seawater with um, the sea surface microlayer, and it didn't change anything. In the kind of the hypothesis was that the sea surface microlayer would be filled with surfactants or organic molecules that could change the ability to form cloud droplets, but that didn't happen yet. Yeah. It might be, but okay, I don't have the standard deviations here. We Yeah. Okay, I would have to look at it it's true when you just look at it it could look like it. It's still kind of a very small uh, small variation and probably within the uncertainty. Yeah. So what we got from this was that, well, what you can see is that it, it doesn't seem like, at least maybe there is something here, but otherwise spiking with sea surface microlayer doesn't really change the ability to form cloud droplets. And um, another thing we did was we were interested in what is the fraction of organic material in these particles. Is it all sea salt or is there some organic in them? And one, th one way that that has been probed sometimes in the literature is that you take your particles and you select a certain size. So in this plot, we selected particles that were 70 nanometers, that was close to the maximum. And then you pass them through an oven, and you can vary the temperature of that oven. It's called a thermodenuder. So we vary the temperature between room temperature and 400 degrees. And then you measure the size when they come out, and it has if it has shrinked, you can calculate what is the volume fraction remaining. So how much has, it, 
has it shrinked in volume. And that's what this plot is, sh is showing. So we did that also for all the samples. Every day we collected, we, we also we did the, C, uh, the measurements of size distribution and CCN activity, but we also measured the volatility in this way. And we got something like this. The volatility didn't really change during the period. Um, and it maybe the volatility was slightly, but not really significantly, <laughs> lower when, when we had spiked the seawater. So if you just looked at this, you could conclude, OK, maybe 20% or more of the sample you have lost is organic. But what we did then was that we did some systematic studies. Because if you put particles that just consist of sodium chloride through this oven, you don't really see a change in size. Only kind of a minimal change in size here. These were our seawater samples, where we saw a significant change in size. Then what we did was that we also studied Sigma sea salt, which is a kind of artificial mix of sea salts that you can buy from Sigma. Or we made our own mix of inorganic salts. That's the green one called sea salts. And we know there should definitely not be any organic molecules in these salt mixtures. And we still see this uh, decrease in the volume fraction remaining. And uh, it has been, uh, what we see here for the seawater is consistent with was has been, there's a nice study by Modini, for example, where they also see this. But we were kind of intrigued, what is it that causes this if it's not um, organic molecules? And what we realized, if you look into the literature, it's known that even if you dry sea salt, it will contain some water. And it's also known that magnesium salts, for example, form hydrates. So what we did is that we had, this is, we did the pure particles only consisting of sodium chloride, and then we mixed part, uh, sodium chloride with magnesium chloride. And what we did we see just from studying volatility of a mixture of sodium chloride and magnesium chloride, we got this behavior. So what we have inferred from this is that one has to be very careful with interpreting data like this, because the hydrates can be playing tricks here and uh, causing these, causing big steps in uh, in volatility. Calcium chloride is also very good at forming hydrates. Okay. That was a little bit of a detailed thing, but um, we were quite happy that we kind of that fitted together this picture. Now, we saw that it was very, it seemed like the sea spray aerosol behaved completely like it consisted only of salt. So one thing we thought was, can we, um, under some circumstances, you know, could there be circumstances where CCN activity would be affected by the organic to a much larger extent? And so we tried to coat particles. We said, okay, what if we shield the salt core by a coating of organics? Will that change the ability to form cloud droplets? And we picked as coating material four different organic acids, long chain acids, and this type of acids has been found in, in the marine environment. And we picked two types. We picked some that has a double bond and then the corresponding one that doesn't have a double bond. And the reason why we did that was that those who have a double bond are liquids and those who don't are solids. So we wanted to compare a solid coating, the effect of a solid coating with the effect of a liquid coating, and then we just had two different chain lengths also of the organic. And so we put sea salt in the sea spray tank, we made particles, we selected one size, and this was our coating system. They just passed through a um, glass bottle here where the organic was at the bottom and we could heat it, and then they came out. We measured the size, and then we measured the ability to form cloud droplets. And this is an example of a set of data. So this is the diameter before coding. This is the diameter after coding. Uh, and the CCN activation curves looked 
very nice. And so it seems like from this that, okay, we are able to code our particles. The question is, <laughs> do you form a full coding when you do this? And um, Or could it be that the coding was sitting on the top, or could there be some entrance to the, for the water molecule to the salt? We tried to answer that question by taking um, uh, images using a cryo-electron microscopy, so we cooled the particles immediately. And this is an image of an uncoded particle. This is after coding. I should say that they didn't always look like, uh, and um, here you can see at least we, we had some organic material on the particles. We also had images where the coating was more sitting, not, uh, not as nicely as here. So we were not able to give a conclusive answer with the uh, electron microscopy, but we could see that we, at least we do have coating or we do have organics on the particles. And what does the organic then mean for the ability to form uh, cloud droplets? So this is a uh, palmitic acid. So this is one that we would expect really to form a solid coating around the particle. You could think that that should prevent cloud droplet activation. What we do see is that, for example, if you follow here, this is the uncoated salt. And then this is um, a particle that has a coating of, what is it, from 30 to 40 something, so 6 nanometer coating thickness, and then it's even thicker, and nothing really happens with the CCN activity, except if we have really thick coatings, and then it's just a small effect. Um, and you see a similar thing here. So. What we conclude from this is that we really need a thin coating just to see some, or very thick coating just to see some effect of CCN activity. And if you plot this for the, um, in a plot of observed kappa value versus calculated value, kappa values, and using the kappa mixing rule, because we know the organic volume fraction, it follows the kappa mixing rule with a kappa value of zero for the organic. So it's really the salt that determines the CCN activity, except if we have really high organic volume fractions. So we plotted as organic volume fractions here, just because we didn't have a kind of a complete answer whether this was, we could also have plotted it in terms of coding signals. But we need a lot of organic material on the particle to get a, um, an effect on CCN activity. Okay, how does it correspond or compare with field data? So there's a nice study by Quinnadel. They use this C sweep um, where they measure in situ uh, CCN activities, and they have these kappa values as a function of particle diameter. And what we do see that it's only the thin coatings that correspond. So these are our data, the green and Blue ones, it's only for the thin coatings that we get something similar to these field data. All the other values with more organic material that are, have much lower kappa values. Okay. So, this was some results, and I will now also tell a little bit about what's going on right now. Um, and one thing is that we have made a new, a second generation of our sea spray tank. Um, and you have a photo of it here. And it was the last month it has been at the uh, EDA chamber at a campaign. Matt Salter was also at that campaign and a student of mine, Sigurd, who has also been very um, key together with Quinn and Guillen in building this tank. And how is it improved? Is it improved compared to the previous one when it has temperature control? It also has a window so we can actually see and photograph what's actually going on in there. And then it has uh, flow meters and a frequency controlled pump uh, so we can um, play more with how we generate the droplets. And um, one thing that we want to target a little bit is 
Okay, so it seems like, um, at least for CCN activity, the particles coming out of the ocean, at least what we have seen and presented here, we don't really see changes in CCN or dependencies in CCN activity. They seem to behave like uh, seesaw. But it has also, it's evident that there is, that the ocean produces, for example, monoterpenes, isoprene, alpha pinene, molecules, and I'll come back to what they can do, but there are organic molecules emitted from the ocean, and it might be a small source compared to what it's being emitted over land, but in the marine environment where there are few particles, it might be significant. And what you can imagine is that you have these sea spray particles coming out of the ocean, you have sunlight, you have radicals, so you have uh, very uh, oxidizing molecules. And then if you have emit emission of terpenes, you have a lot of chemistry going on. And that has been studied very well um, in lab and field studies. So we know there's a lot of complex chemistry going on. And the end products of all this chemistry are low volatile organic molecules. So what can happen when your sea spray aerosol is emitted from the ocean, meets all these molecules, it will change it, its character. It might be a coated particle or it might be just has, has changed. And it has different properties. We say that it's chemically aged. So it might, has cha it might have changed properties. And um, we have a new facility to study this. And um, it was the Department of Chemistry. Some of you have, have seen it, but we have made what's called a smog chamber. It's a Teflon bag, and we have uh, UV lights above and below it, below it. And what's special about this Teflon chamber is that uh, it's inside a temperature control room. So we can control temperature between 25 and minus 16 degrees. And um, we have uh, different types of instrumentation to follow the chemical and physical properties of whatever is in here, both in the gas phase, but also in the particle phase. So what we have done now is that we have put ozone and alpha pinene in here, and we have studied what happens, and we have compared that with the literature to kind of validate our setup. And the next thing we want to do is to connect our sea spray tank with the chamber and to chemically age sea spray particles and look how does that change their properties. Um, and if you have ideas or things, I'm very happy to discuss later this afternoon. And then before I end, I just want also to, another thing we will do that Aarhus University has a brand new research vessel, it's called Aurora, and there is uh, there's actually a laboratory also made for air measurements. There's a, um, in front of the uh, exhaust stack, there's a, in the right place compared to that one, there are also air intakes and things. So we are planning also to do measurements on uh, this ship. And with that, I will end. So what we have found or what I've discussed is that with respect to cloud droplet formation, in most cases, what we have seen is that fresh sea spray aerosols seem to be dominated by the salt content. And for fatty acid coatings, we can model it, we model it with the kappa mixing rule, with kappa equal to zero for the organic, for what we would say would probably be realistic coating sequences. The volatility of fresh sea spray aerosol can be influenced by hydrates. It's a technical thing to keep in mind. This I skipped, so I won't see, say anything about this. And then for future things, what we will do is to try to age sea spray at this uh, new smog chamber facility, and we will also take some of the equipment, hopefully, on board the Aurora ship. And I should thank the people who have been doing this, it's postdocs in my group, both in Copenhagen and Aarhus, Stephanie, Thomas, Kirsten, Quinn, Kasper, Andrew and Sigurd, and Lærke, Beat and Beat. And then a lot has also been taking place in collaboration with the excellent people here in Stockholm. So, 
Thanks for your attention. Yeah, it's it's the Baltic mainly, and up along the Nordic, uh, uh, the coast of, yeah, it's the Baltic mainly, around the Dane and Denmark. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Might go to other places. Great. Yeah. Thanks for a very nice talk. Uh, I was just wondering about the enrichment. This is not my area, so I'm going to be just really naive, but what, what does that mean? Is it just that? The smaller particles that are enriched in organics and inorganic ions too, are they just, do they have different source processes or is it like some sort of chemical process? I don't think I understand. It's a very good good question. I didn't show any explanation. I just showed what has been observed, that that, uh, that the, small the small particles have a larger content of organic material compared to salt than the bigger ones. They're both formed in a bubble breaking process. Of course, we would like to understand that, and we would also like to see can we reproduce that in the lab to help us understand why this is going on. Yeah. Thanks for your talk, and uh, maybe because of your question, I mean, the effect is also, I think, what you ask is it also has an effect, for example, on on hygroscopicity. So how much these particles take up water? So that's why you study this at different sizes. Because yes. It also affects. The optical properties. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but one question I had on your organic, on your coating experiments. So you had a big change in the kappa, so in the hygroscopicity. Like, is was this some, the, the 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 fatty acids you choose? Are these atmospheric relevant organics, or is it because I mean, of course, you see a huge difference. While in your other coat, uh, in your experiments from the Aarhus Bay, where you brought the um, water into the lab and you looked at the Supersaturation versus diameter. You didn't see any change uh, uh, with p spiked water without, or, or the normal mm. water. So I was just confused a little bit. Is, were these atmospheric relevant experiments? This for the they were acids? model compounds. I mean, fatty acids are formed in of are fine, found in the um, in the marine uh, in the water. But this was also kind of a model study to see what what would it take to change the uh, CCN activity. That's quite a lot. Huh? Yeah. To change it. Quite yeah. A lot. I, I also have a question, actually, yeah. um, following on from what Paul said there. I wonder about the, I mean, what you show is that the, it, it looks as like you have to do a lot in terms of adding organics to actually change the, the CC activity of the, of the sea salt particles. So I wonder what are the potential implications from a, from a modeling perspective? Because I know the way we do it right now is that you have a, we said we have these two components, the sea salt component, well, generally we have a sea salt component and then a, an organic component, and, and somehow we, we try to combine these together to, to approximate that there is this, this pattern that we see here, this enrichment of organics. But, uh, and this has some knock-on effect on the hygroscopicity or the cloud-forming potential of these particles. But it looks as though there is very little impact, at least from a fresh sea spray perspective. Yeah, of course it changes the, the volume fraction or the mass fraction mm. of your salt. Yes, but it doesn't. But it, but it doesn't. It sort of doesn't knock on in the way that we expect in terms of how how they activate CC, a CCN. So that was what we saw in this study that mm. we could model it basically with a cap of. So yeah. yeah. So I mean, I think you, you, the implication is that there are processes going on after their formation, which, as you allude to, that they're aging and that they're becoming less hygroscopic by some kind of condensation of organics or things like this in, in the atmosphere. Yeah, that's what we want to do in the chamber studies to make mm. it more realistic than this uh, code yeah. in, a, in a bottle. But I think what we're doing right now is we're probably approximating this effect, but people are treating it as if it's the, it's the fresh sea spray that's already less hygroscopic. But actually, it's probably they come out potentially hygroscopic, but then become less hygroscopic, I guess. That's what we want to look into, yeah. Mm. Yes. OK. If there, if there are no more questions, I think perhaps we should uh, sort of close up here, and then we can follow up later with Moretta if you want to carry on. So let's thank Moretta again. Thank you. Thank you.